Hello, hello. Welcome back to Mistress of the Dam. If you are new here, welcome. This is where we believe that all knowledge is worth having and freedom of speech is our most important right. If you believe that too, then you too are damned. I am your Mistress Katrina. Welcome to hell. Knowledge, I have found, is best found in books where you can read them and form your own opinion on the topic at hand. And since it's the last Monday of the month, the topic at hand is U.S. Presidents. Continuing our pursuit of knowledge in order in which they serve puts this month's president as James Monroe, which means this week's book of the week is The Last Founding Father, James Monroe and a Nation's Call to Greatness by Harlow Giles Unger. Monroe was one of those presidents that I didn't know much about beyond he wrote something called the Monroe Doctrine, and I had no idea what that was or why it was so important. I'm sure some teacher somewhere told me, but that's exactly what I mean. Seeking out knowledge for yourself just for the pleasure of learning something, just for knowing knowledge, um, kind of helps that knowledge stick versus just being told what to think by educators. So let's do this. James Monroe was born April 28, 1758 in Westmoreland County, Virginia. He was second born. He had one older sister, Elizabeth, and three younger brothers, Spencer, Andrew, and Joseph Jones. Monroe and his siblings were left orphans when Monroe was 15. Uh, his mom died when he was 14, and his dad died about a year later. Fortunately for the Monroe children, his uncle on his mother's side was Judge Joseph Jones, and he stepped in and sort of took over the family. He... he paid their debts, and he left Elizabeth with money to care for the three younger Monroes while claiming direct guardianship of James himself, uh, which meant he took James to Williamsburg, Virginia with him and enrolled him at college at the College of William and Mary, which is the second oldest school in America, the first being Harvard. Now, College of William and Mary was basically a breeding ground for rebellion at this time. Since all the Virginia planters families sent their sons there, the Virginia planters stood to lose the most from British taxation, and so I mean, the, the teachers were all like Scottish Protestants and Scotland, you may or may not know, was not in love with England at the time or pretty much ever. So with a little bit of college behind them, they rebelled. Boy, is that sounding familiar? Many of the young scions of Virginia joined the militia when revolution was declared and Monroe was one of them. Now, he joined the Virginia militia and was with Washington when they crossed the Delaware on Christmas night, 1776. At the time, he was Lieutenant Monroe, and he was with, I think it's a nephew or a cousin of, of General Washington's. It was Captain William Washington. They kind of rushed a cannon emplacement, and Captain Washington was shot. Monroe continued the assault like a good officer should. Um, you know what? I say that. I shouldn't say that. I, I don't know what a good officer should do. Maybe he should have retreated. Regardless, he rushed the cannon was also wounded, but they were ultimately successful. They took the cannon emplacement. The Battle of Trenton was a huge success, as everybody knows. Um, that, that was kind of when the war started to turn to the favor of the... Oh, the cat's back. Started turning into the favor of the uh, rebelling Americans. Luckily for Monroe, General Washington was right behind the charge with his surgeon, which is good because the musket ball that Monroe had taken uh, severed an artery, and he would have bled out right there if it weren't for the surgeon being boom on hand, able to help. Monroe was promoted to captain, but unfortunately for him, and this is odd, but okay, I mean, we're used to having a standing army in the National Guard, and they're always recruiting, and they give you your troops and tell you what you need to do with them. But back then, captains of militia were responsible for recruiting and training their own men. Uh, he was unable to do so, mainly because he was completely penniless, so he had no money to offer as a recruitment incentive. Do you have an opinion on this? He was unable to recruit or train his own men because he didn't have any money as, to offer as an incentive. Since he wasn't able to do that, he reported to General Washington, who was basically impressed by his actions at the Battle of Trenton, and promoted Monroe to Major, made him an aide-de-camp to Brigadier General William Alexander Lord Sterling. Now, under Sterling, Monroe learned a lot about military tactics and leadership. Uh, Monroe was a bit more dedicated to the men than Lord Sterling. And when winter 1777 set in at Valley Forge, Sterling went home because that's what high-ranking officers did. They didn't stay with the men, they went home. And we had uh, foster, we're all in this together attitude, which is the way that Monroe went. And he stayed at Valley Forge. Um, he renewed his friendship with his childhood friend, John Marshall, who would later become a Supreme Court judge. And he forged a lifelong friendship with the Marquis de Lafayette, now, this second friendship with Lafayette turned Monroe into a lifelong Francophile and kind of laid the groundwork for his later successes as minister, which was basically ambassador to France. 
Monroe continued to fight with the Continental Army until resigning his commission in December 1778. He basically had nowhere to go with this. So he retired his commission in 1778. He received no payment for his military service, but that's basically his fault. He was overtaken by this kind of patriotic fervor, I guess, when the war started. And so he had heard that Washington said that he'd fight for free. And so Monroe was like, oh, fight for free. Uh, not knowing that the Continental Congress had said, yeah, that, that's great, General Washington, but we're still going to pay your expenses for you. Um, they did not have any such insistence with Monroe, so when he retired, he was completely penniless. His uncle, however, welcomed him back and eventually netted him a law clerkship with Governor of Virginia Thomas Jefferson. And Monroe was a really diligent law student and protege of Jefferson's. I mean, this started a 25-year friendship between the two men. Eventually, Monroe did pass the bar in Virginia, and he became a pretty successful lawyer. I mean, he was very good at his job, by all accounts. In April 1782, Judge Jones was voted to the Continental Congress. At the time, he was serving in the General Assembly of Virginia, so when he was voted into the Continental Congress, he said, well, how about my nephew, J young James Monroe, to replace me for G General Assembly? And he did, along with his friend John Marshall. So John Marshall and James Monroe kind of have this hmm, lifelong orbit around each other. They basically just, their, their careers piggybacked off each other all the way up to the top. Now, in 1786, Monroe met Elizabeth Courtright and basically was just immediately smitten. Uh, Elizabeth, being a woman of good sense and intelligence, was equally smitten, and the two were married in New York. Now, she was about 10 years younger than him. Again, not at all uncommon for that time. Uncommon, though, in that she was very well educated. So there's kind of this running theme with our founding fathers where they don't marry just for good looks. That's certainly part of it, but they marry well in meaning somebody who is intellectually capable of keeping up with them. So it kind of proves the adage that pick a good partner and you can go far in life. They picked good partners. So far, every single one of them has picked a good partner. He married Elizabeth Courtright in 1786 at, in New York, which is where she was at, before they moved to Virginia and Monroe kept up with his law practice. Now, he practiced until 1790, so seven years or so. Monroe practiced law until 1790, at which time one of the first senators of the state of Virginia died in office, which left a vacancy in the 18th century, when the Constitution was first written, senators were not direct elected by the people. They were elected by the legislatures of the individual states. When the senator died, the legislature in Virginia nominated Monroe to take his place. And so in 1790, Monroe became a senator for the state of Virginia. He was senator until 1794, so he didn't quite serve the whole term when he was appointed by George Washington as minister to France. In France, Monroe was basically supposed to keep the French from attacking American shipping interests. What he found was chaos and blood. Um, he stepped into France in the middle uh, or middle end of the French Revolution. Napoleon was just starting to come up to power. Robespierre had already been executed himself. And Monroe was kind of horrified to find that the wife of his friend, the Marquis Lafayette, was in prison awaiting execution. Uh, and the Mar Marquis' children were in hiding. So... This is a pretty bold moment here for, for America, and especially for a woman in the 18th century. Elizabeth Monroe went to visit Adrienne in prison. Now, Elizabeth was very beautiful. Uh, everybody acknowledged her incredible grace and beauty, her intelligence. So she went to visit Adrienne in prison and expressed so much friendship for Adrienne that essentially she was able to just walk her out of prison. Wasn't that an interesting jailbreak? That would never happen today. The guards and the people were so floored by the boldness and by her declarations of friendship that they cheered her on. And Adrian went and had sanctuary with the Monroes while James drew up paperwork proclaiming her an American citizen by virtue of her marriage. And the Marquis was definitely an American citizen because of the blood he had spilled during the American War for Independence. While Adrian sheltered at Monroe's house, James found her children, then helped her to smuggle George Washington Lafayette to America, where he would live a while with his godfather, the president. Imagine how awkward that would have been as a diplomatic cock-up if the France had actually killed the U.S. president's godchild. <laughs> that could have been awkward. But Monroe got the kid out, got Adrian and her daughters out. I believe he smuggled them to Holland, where they would live until this kind of bloody wave ended, and they were able to return to France. Monroe was in France for two years. He was eventually recalled 
when he returned, he again began his law practice, got that going again, and then ran for governor of Virginia. He served three consecutive one-year terms. Now, at the time, that was the maximum that was allowed under Virginia law. You, you could serve no more than three terms consecutively. You could take a break and come back, and he does. But for now, he served the maximum allowed, and then attempted to retire to his country estates where he wanted to be a farmer. And he was a pretty good farmer. He was able to keep his fields fertile. He, he kept them, you know, wrote, he did the crop rotations and the clover to replenish the soil and lime bass, quick lime to, to help bring up the acidic level, base level, to balance out the pH. Whatever lime does, that's what he did. I think it was Monroe experienced a common problem of the Americas in the 18th century in that while Congress had the ability to mint money for, for the Constitution, they hadn't quite gotten there, and so a lot of states had their own money, and inflation was wild. Uh, they, they hadn't basically unified that system of money yet. And so a lot of people were rich in land, and he had a ton of acreage. He owned two farms that were like 5,000 acres each, like another 10,000 acres in Kentucky. So he was very wealthy from a land perspective, but he had no actual cash on hand. So he's sitting there on a great deal of land, which is, he's great as a farmer, but a lot of what he farms has to go towards maintaining his estate, including these slaves he owned, because he was a Virginia planter. They all own slaves. Shouldn't, I shouldn't categorize like that. I don't think they all own slaves. It kind of bugs me. It's, it's kind of glossed over in here. He doesn't go into a great deal of detail regarding Monroe's slave holdings. Retired to be a farmer until 1803, one President Thomas Jefferson assigned him again as minister to France. Now, once he was in France, he picked up where Minister Robert Livingston had laid the groundwork for Louisiana Purchase, and Monroe basically wrapped up the deal. Kind of a bold step, because the instructions that he was given, both him and, and uh, Livingston were given by Jefferson and Secretary of State Madison, were to purchase New Orleans and West Florida. Now, that's all they were allowed to do, and it was only supposed to be for like $9 million. That was the maximum they were authorized. Monroe laid this offer before his counterpart in France, and it wasn't Napoleon, I don't remember his name, I should have made a note, oh well, he made the offer, and the counter offer was, well how about all of our territories in America for 15 million, and Monroe said yes, because it was a limited time offer, basically by the time he had sent the offer across the sea, because remember, no phones, no telegrams, no emails, everything was done the old fashioned way with pen and ink and a ship, not even a plane, so by the time the offer had gotten to America and it had been debated by Congress, <laughs> you know, we all know how effective Congress is, been invaded by Congress and the president and the secretary of state and then come back, the offer could have been off the table. So Monroe said, yes, we'll do it. $15 million, we're going to take, you know, one third of the continental United States from you. Perfect. And it worked. The president was happy, Madison was happy, Congress was happy, the people in the United States were happy. Uh, we basically bought one third of the land for the bargain basement price of four cents an acre. Government would then turn around and sell that land to settlers for two dollars an acre, so that's a hell of a markup. The land in question was an undeniably good purchase because it basically became the breadbasket of the United States, rich croplands as well as rich veins of gold and copper and oil fields. So overall, a pretty sweet deal for the United States. But now, Monroe gets kind of shafted. He is next ordered to England to act as minister there, trying to get the British to stop the impressment of U.S. sailors. And that was basically the only guidance that was given to him before he went to England. And then Madison and Jefferson stopped communicating with him. So he'd write to them for guidance and would receive no answer. And Monroe hated England. The, the air was dirty and smutty because of the coal fires, which aggravated his wife and his daughter's asthma. The British snubbed him socially, and he was not able to really accomplish much. Eventually, Congress insisted that a new minister be sent, and William Pinckney was sent to replace him, which he didn't even find out from Jefferson and Madison, so that just kind of continued his anger and contributed to the rift that it didn't end their 25-year friendship, but it definitely caused a rift. He found out when the London papers published the story. So he felt slighted there. Hard to blame him. Despite that, he worked well with Pinckney because he knew what it was like to be the incoming minister and to have your counterpart that you're replacing treat you like garbage because that's what happened to him in France. So he worked well with Pinckney. 
And they did manage to broker some sort of a treaty with England, but it was basically quashed by Jefferson. Monroe was given to believe by supporters of his that it was quashed intentionally to give Madison a clear run at the White House. Because if it became known that Monroe had both brokered the Louisiana Purchase and negotiated a successful treaty with Britain, he would have been a surefire thing. That would have been huge because he could have, you know, he would have been instrumental in avoiding a war. Monroe was so upset by this quashing that he stopped communicating with Madison at all and kind of only reluctantly resumed communication with Jefferson after he'd returned, after Monroe had returned to the United States. He did run against Madison in 1808, but did not really campaign, campaign much. Um, he ran because he was nominated, but he didn't, his heart really wasn't in it, and so he lost by a fair margin, and Monroe was set to, again, retire from politics. He was more or less happy to be a farmer for, let me think, three years? Three years. Then in 1811, Madison appointed go then-governor John Tyler to a vacant judgeship. Not the Supreme Court. He wasn't a Supreme, but he, he appointed him to a judgeship, which left the governor's seat open. Monroe ran for that and was in office for a very short amount of time when Madison came to him and said, hey, how about the position of Secretary of State? You've got solid years of service as a diplomat. You did well in France. You did well in England. I need somebody who's skilled in diplomacy. Why don't you come be Secretary of State? And Monroe basically said okay, but only if you publicly announce that I needed more for my expertise in diplomacy. I was just elected governor, and I feel like I should really serve my term, but if you publicly acknowledge to the people that you want my diplomatic skills, sure, I'll do it. Okay. And Madison did. It's nice having a little bit of power there, right? Monroe served as Secretary of State from April 1811 until he was sworn in as president in March of 1817. He also served as temporary Secretary of War during the War of 1812, which certainly helped boost him into the White House when Madison retired. Monroe served two terms in the White House where he managed to keep expanding the U.S. territory, eventually taking over all of Florida from Spain and agreeing to territorial boundaries with Spain and the United States. Taking over all of Florida from Spain happened because he sort of with a wink and a nod is like, hey, yeah, Jackson, why don't you go see what you can do with Florida there? And he didn't quite authorize an attack on Florida, but he also said, I'm not going to punish you if you do it. And so Jackson rolled in, committed the atrocities for which he is known, killed a bunch of Native Americans. <laughs> I don't, know. I don't I'm prematurely judging here. I, I should really wait until I read the book on Jackson to reach a decision, but I'm judging. I'm totally judging. So anyways, they got Florida. During his first term, he basically went on tours of the United States, which hadn't been done since Washington was president. When Washington was elected in, he basically did a writing tour of all of the states to get to know the people and to let himself be seen, which is a huge deal in the 18th century, right? It's not easy to get to do that traveling because you don't have a car, you don't have a bus. By Monroe's time, there were steamships, so that helped with the waterways, but mostly it was done on horseback. And so it took a great deal of time to, to make all the traveling that he did, but he did it and the people loved him for it. His presidency was not marked by any huge problems or controversies. It was kind of considered a golden era of peace. The budget was balanced, bills were paid off. He was able to cut taxes unilaterally because they were selling so much land from the Louisiana Purchase that they didn't need to tax people. <laughs> Yay, less taxation. That's always a win. And then his famous Monroe Doctrine was actually part of his State of the Union address in Congress on December 2nd, 1823. So his seventh, not his last, but his next to last. Basically, it said the old world, meaning the Eurasian continent, so all of Europe going into Russia, and the new world, the American continents, were separate spheres of influence. And the old world should probably stay over there and leave the Americas alone. That we as a nation were able and willing to defend our borders from encroachment. It wasn't much. It was maybe a seventh, maybe a, th maybe a thousand words out of the 7,000 speech. But it reinstilled a great deal of national pride. And pretty much every president since has used it to justify whatever skullfuckery they want to against the rest of the world. I'm not sure if Monroe would be proud or horrified. Now, some interesting points that I picked up 
reading this book. Monroe was a Democratic Republican like Jefferson and Madison before him. He believed the Constitution was designed to limit the federal government and that power rested with the people. However, <laughs> once his good buddy Justice John Marshall was appointed Chief of the Supreme Court, that changed. Because Marshall was an old-school Federalist. He saw the Constitution as enabling whatever the federal government wanted so long as they could claim it was for the good of the people. And once Marshall passed that judgment down through the courts, Monroe did not hold back. Roads were built, canals were dug, we annexed Florida, all for the good of the people, and with a great deal of bloodshed. It's interesting reading these in order of presidential service because it's kind of like seeing a shifting puzzle and watching the pieces fall into place. Um, in Britain, the reason Monroe was treated badly was because the English diplomat to Washington took offense when Jefferson did not s escort the diplomat's wife into dinner. No mention of that is made in this book, only that Monroe was snubbed socially. So I know why, because of my books on Jefferson and Madison. And I'm sort of starting to get sneak peeks at John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, William Henry Harrison, who are all introduced a bit more detail in this book and in last month's book. When Monroe left the White House, he was basically destitute. He owed about $75,000, which is nothing to sneeze at today, but was absolutely enormous sum in the 19th century. He crept, kept creditors at bay for a bit by selling off bits of his land. He presented a bill to Congress for reimbursements from his time as a diplomat. Some of the charges were accepted, others were not, and it left him still in debt. In 1830, his wife died and he was absolutely devastated. He ultimately moved in with his youngest daughter and her husband. Congress, when they found out about that, eventually approved more funding to pay off the balance of his debts. So at least he had no debts when he died on July 4th, 1831. That's like three of the first five presidents died on July 4th. 4th. I mean, if I'm president, I'm not sure if I'm celebrating or waiting for the Grim Reaper, just, just in case he shows. July 4th seems kind of like a bad luck day to be president at this point. I'm not sure how I feel about Monroe. I think he was probably a very able diplomat. I think the American people of the day loved him because he saw them. And he makes a powerful statement traveling by horseback to visit the people that, that you govern, right? That, that takes a lot. But he had no real stance on slavery, at least none that was mentioned in the book. He owned slaves himself, and about the only comment made in the book is that he felt they shouldn't be abused. And that's like the bare minimum, right? <laughs> so that's hard. When he was governor, he put down the slave rebellion, Gaber's Rebellion in Virginia, which occurred in 1800. No sympathy for the slaves. He just hung them with a sort of, well, the law is the law, shrug. And I know you can't really judge history based on the Moors of today. It's been 220 years since since then, and times are very different. Then it's really easy to sit in judgment from a safe distance of 220 years, right? Not being there, not understanding the actual currents that were going on politically and in, in reality. But he also sort of spurred on Andrew Jackson, who was definitely not kind to Native Americans. Madison, Jefferson, and Washington all owned slaves, but they all came to see this as evil. They just weren't sure of the best way to end the practice, and so ultimately left it for future generations, which, I mean, we all know that did not end well. So I think my current presidential ranking is going to be John Adams, because again, his high principles. James Madison, uh, because he followed the Constitution to the absolute best. George Washington, because he freed his slaves. He recognized it was evil and he freed his slaves while on his death. Thomas Jefferson, um, because he was an able statesman, he also kept to the Constitution. He did write the Declaration of Independence. And then James Monroe. Because while one shouldn't judge the past by the Moors of today, one does all the time. And that's it for this week. Thank you all for watching. If you liked what you saw, make sure you hit that subscribe button, share my video, and let me know what you think in the comments. I will see you all next week when we return to authoritarian regimes with the rise and fall of the Third Reich. That's so gonna suck. <laughs> see you all next week. Bye.